So uh, welcome everybody to this talk about quickly test your uh, kernel with uh, GitLab CI. My name is Ellen Koike. I'm a senior software engineer at Conlabra. I use it to be a kernel contributor with the media subsystem. Then I moved uh, to work with CI with the Mesa project, uh, which is the user space part of the graphics stack. And now I am current maintainer of the MCI that we are going to uh, talk a bit in, uh, during this uh, presentation. So uh, what we will uh, cover here. So first, we are, we are going to understand why GitLab CI in the first place. To answer that, we are going to uh, uh, see what's the usual kernel testing workflow, its limitations, and how a workflow with GitLab CI fill the gaps there and how uh, to use GitLab CI to test the kernel with one of those uh, two implementations. So we have their MCI and KCI GitLab. Then a few thoughts about uh, moving forward and how to contribute. My goal with this presentation is um, I would like to convince you that uh, a workflow with GitLab CI has a great value. And I would like to convince you that it's very easy to use one of those implementations. So maybe you give it a try. So let's start with uh, why GitLab CI. First, uh, let's review the usual uh, kernel testing workflow. So let's go together uh, through each of uh, those boxes in this diagram. First there, we have um, the state that patches work in progress when a developer is starting working on something. Then eventually this patch is good to go. So the patch gets submitted to the mailing list so we move to the second box there. After getting some reviews, this patch gets accepted and merged. So we are in the third box there. From there, we can go through uh, different paths. So let's start with the top one. After this patch got merged, uh, let's say we have a CI system monitoring that uh, branch. This CI system executes tests on top of that, of that branch and eventually finds a regression so uh, this CI system notifies maintainers or developers about it. So we are in the last uh, box there. And eventually the developers start working on the fix and we restart uh, this loop, right? The second path that we can go from the third box there, uh, so after the patch gets accepted and merged, this patch can be deployed to a product. From here, we have also two paths, so uh, let's start the one with the one from the top. So this prod product can be uh, in, some C in some lab being monitored by a CI system, uh, which catches a bug, then report back to maintainers and developers, and we start this loop. And the second uh, path from the fourth uh, box there is that this product is actually used by end users of this product, and the user finds a regression report back to the community, to the company, and the company eventually um, reports back to the maintainer or the developer about it, then we restart this process. There are a few limitations with this model that uh, we are going to talk about. So here, uh, limitations for the CI system here, the CI system, it requires a complex reporting system uh, to not report uh, false positives. The CI system cannot detect low priorities or won't fix cases. So it starts reporting things uh, that will just add up to the backlog and stay there forever, maybe. It cannot detect if the failure that it found is a failure of uh, the kernel code itself or if it is um, a problem with the test suite that wasn't updated. Uh, so the CI system here uh, also to provide these reports, it needs to figure out who to send this report to. So it requires a good bisection to do that as well, uh, which can be very challenging, uh, especially when you have flakes. And I can say that, uh, so I'm working uh, with, the Linux, uh, with the kernel CI project, and I can say that we do struggle with um, those challenges, which are not trivial uh, to solve. 
few more limitations. So if the reports here are not relevant, the developer uh, is just start ignoring the results or even start complaining about them uh, because they are getting spammed uh, for something that's not really relevant. And as a consequence, we have a low community engagement and sometimes even an aversion of automated testing. Uh, if you watched uh, the talk, uh, the previous talk from uh, Laura about uh, the quality of tests on Linux kernel, she mentioned about uh, restoring trust uh, with uh, the kernel CI. So this is one of the problems there. And the other thing is, if nothing uh, was reported, uh, people are not really sure if tests were actually run or not. So what I'm saying is that our workflow uh, with GitLab CI can fill these gaps. So let's understand how. This is the same diagram that we saw before with uh, two small differences. The first one is uh, on the green box up there where uh, the developers or maintainers test uh, their patches with uh, GitLab CI and they can trigger those tests while the patch is working in progress or after it got submi submitted to the mailing list. So we can see that we uh, drag the, uh, the, the testing process uh, much earlier in this um, workflow. And the second difference here is uh, in the third box there where patch gets accepted and merged only if all tests are green uh, which means that all tests passes. And this makes a really good um, difference. So let's uh, go through them. So when we have this policy that patches are merged only if all tests passes, we have a few advantages there. Detectable regressions aren't merged, even uh, small or low priority ones. So we stop um, adding low priority uh, bugs uh, in the backlog. And if the issue is in the test suite, uh, the developers are really motivated to get involved and fix them, or they go and fix them themselves, or they uh, report to the person responsible for the test suite. Otherwise, uh, they won't get their patch merged. So they need uh, to care about this. If uh, the issue is because the infrastructure is down, let's say, the developers are motivated to report back uh, because they really need to show, uh, to, to show maintainers they executed the test uh, to validate their patch set. So we can see that this model motivates developers and maintainers to be mindful of tests. And here we increase uh, this community engagement in testing culture. Also, um, failures are detected uh, before merge or even before submitting the patch. We uh, call these uh, pre-merge tests. And when we promote an always green culture, we mean that uh, so all the tests must be passing before your patch set, without your patch set. And the test must continue to pass with your patch set. So, which means that when you test your patch set and you see a problem there, it's a problem of your patch set, so there's uh, no bisection is require, required and a no uh, complex reporting system is required. So where we are? So we talked about why GitLab CI and I hope I convinced you uh, the value of it. So uh, we mentioned about um, what's the usual current testing workflow, the limitations and uh, how uh, GitLab CI fill these gaps. Now let's move on to the, some actual implementations. So first the IMCI and then uh, KCI GitLab. So for the IMCI, we're going to talk about what it is, the supported test there, how to use it, and also its limitations. So um, DRMCI is actually a GitLab CI pipeline uh, for the DRM uh, subsystem, so the, for the graphics stack. It is a derivative work from the Mesa CI project, where uh, in the, uh, during the Mesa project, um, in the Mesa project, they have this model that I just shown you uh, working, uh, implemented uh, for some time. Uh, you can, if you are interested in understanding more about the Mesa project, you can uh, see the talk from uh, David Heidelberg that was, um, I guess, two slots before this one. Uh, you can check the recording about GPU testing. 
So the RM site was released with a kernel 6.7. The original patch was from Tomeu Fisoso, and uh, right now I'm maintaining it. Uh, and the most active contributor is uh, a colleague called uh, Wignesh uh, Raman. And the RM site is mostly used by maintainers to validate patches. So supported tests, uh, let's go through what this picture means. So this is a print of one of the pipelines uh, from DRMCI. Uh, it's a print of the, of, uh, the GitLab CI uh, user interface. So each column here represents a testing stage and each box is a job uh, within that testing stage. So the first stage there is the container stage where uh, the jobs builds containers uh, installing everything that is required for the, other, for the rest of the jobs to execute. The second stage there is the build stage where we actually build the kernel with a few configurations. So uh, the first three, three jobs there, we are building the kernel uh, for a different architecture. So we have um, ARM32, ARM64, and x86-64. And we also build the test suite for the um, graphic stack that's called IGT, so IGT uh, GPU2. We also build uh, those on those three architectures. And the last three jobs under that uh, stage on the second column there uh, are also building the kernel with a different configuration uh, that will be used for the rest of the pipeline uh, to, to execute tests on top. So from there, we have now stages that uh, one, st one stage per driver. So the third column there, uh, for instance, is a stage showing tests for the AMD GPU driver that uh, executes the IGT2 that we just built on top of the kernel that we just built. Uh, and it executes on a specific device. In that case, there is a Stony device. I'm not sure if you're able to see, uh, to read it, uh, which is hosted in one of um, the, the labs, the integrated labs. The other one is uh, the driver for Intel, the i915, and we also execute a test on top of different devices. So each of those jobs um, are, uh, represents a test, uh, a test suite executed, being executed on a different device on a lab. And we have the same thing for uh, MediaTek, for a Meson driver, for the MSM driver, for the Rock chip driver, for the Pump Frost driver. And the last stage here is a software driver where we actually don't test, uh, don't run IGT on any specific device, but we test on top of a virtual machine. So we have a test for a virtu uh, virtual GPU driver, and we also have a test for the VK VKMS, which is the virtual driver for um, KMS uh, in the kernel, meant uh, for exercising, uh, testing uh, with the um, KMS core code and DRM. So um, how DRM works? So at this moment, it only works with Free Desktop GitLab instance, but anyone is free to create an account there uh, and uh, execute their MCI. So when you push your code to a repository there, the infrastructure provides um, shared machines that we call runners that will pick your job and execute them. And those runners are shared across uh, all the projects inside uh, Free Desktop. For the device specific tests, they are dispatched to uh, its corresponding lab that hosts those devices. And this lab dispatch the job to the specific device. Uh, so the results are collected and displayed uh, to the um, GitLab uh, interface. Right. And one really nice thing uh, about the MCI is that it is, um, we have a documented uh, we have um, the state of tests are really documented inside the kernel code. So per driver, we keep track of the expected failures, the known flakes, uh, and the skipped tests. This is very interesting because at some point of history, you can uh, check the quality of the drivers there regarding uh, the tests that are currently run. Uh, and this is, uh, there is a mechanism that keeps this in sync uh, because of the always green uh, policy, since those affect uh, the behavior of the CI. 
So for instance, if a test is listed under expected failure, uh, it means that if it, the test fails, the job is green, and if the test passes, the job is red. So let's say that you make a, a patch fixing the patch, fixing a given test. Uh, to make your pipeline green, you need to remove uh, this test from the expected uh, failure list. And this is really nice because we can see which point that that uh, specific test was actually fixed. Also together with uh, non flex so flakes are tests that eventually passes and eventually fail fails. Uh, so we have a list there so the CI can ignore its results. Uh, so we cannot trust those tests. And um, in, in these files, we have a documented uh, report, a bug report about those flakes. And we put there when we first saw that flake happening. And we also uh, keep a list of tests that uh, the CI is skipping. Uh, we can skip tests because uh, it doesn't make sense to run on specific device or because the test is crashing and we are not able to run the rest of the tests. So uh, we put in skip test and we document there why we are skipping uh, the test so anyone can take a look and understand the current state of it. So how you can use um, DRM CI? So first you need to create an account under gitlab.freedesktop.org. You can just create a Linux tree repository. And the only thing that you need to do is you go through the project setting uh, and switch the CI slash CD configuration file to point to that file there, driver slash GPU slash DRM slash CI slash gitlab ci.yaml. Uh, and then you also need to ask uh, to join the DRM slash CI OK group uh, on free desktop GitLab for the necessary CI privileges. You can request this um, by creating uh, an issue there in the group, or you can just ping someone from the community uh, through the main list or through IRC. So next time you push your uh, code to your repository, it should trigger a pipeline. So this is a print of the GitLab CI user interface for those who are not familiar with it. Uh, in the menu on the right side, it selected pipelines. And every time that you push your code, you should see a new entry here uh, with your pipeline uh, being executed and the results of it. DRM CI also has a few limitations. So the first limitation is that it, uh, at this moment, it is very specific to the DRM subsystem, and it only works uh, on free desktop GitLab instance. As I mentioned before, the runners are shared, uh, shared uh, across all the projects on free desktop, uh, which means people need to be mindful uh, of resource utilization, especially that we have uh, a few projects under the uh, GitLab CI instance there, the FreeDesktop GitLab CI instance, uh, that all the development process happens inside uh, the GitLab CI, differently from the kernel where we submit patches through the mailing list. And um, if the CI there, so for instance, Mesa CI project, if the CI um, takes too long to reply, uh, it can block merge requests uh, to be merged. Uh, so it's more time critical. And also Mesa CI share the same devices used by their MCI, which means that we need to run uh, their MCI with lower priority compared to Mesa CI. So to overcome these limitations, we propose a new solution uh, called KCI GitLab that we are going to uh, take a look. So uh, KCI GitLab, we're going to see what it is, uh, the supported test there, how to use it, how to extend it, uh, the community response, and the proposed future features. So let's start with what it is. So it is uh, a patch set submitted to the community on February 28th uh, this year. For reference, that's the title of uh, the patch set. So um, KCI uh, GitLab, introducing GitLab CI pipeline for uh, kernel testing. It was developed together with the kernel CI communi community. That's why we have uh, KCI under its name. And it allows tests to be executed on any uh, GitLab instance. It is more, it's a more generic solution and it also allows uh, customizations. Uh, so when we think about subsystem, we can think that each subsystem is a different community. 
they even uh, have, um, they run check patch with different arguments, they can run different tests, so it's very important uh, for, uh, for KCI GitLab to be extendable. So let's look, take a look at it. So this patch set added a few files and folders. So first we have uh, a .gitlabci.yaml file under the root directory uh, inside the Linux kernel. So every time you push to any GitLab instance, it will show you a pipeline by default. We have documentation under documentation slash ci slash GitLab CI folder, and the rest of the code uh, goes inside the fo that folder. So it's a folder there, so uh, CI slash uh, GitLab CI. So here are uh, the current tests that it runs. So we have a first stage there, which is the container stage, very similar to the MCI that builds a container with everything that's required uh, to the rest of the jobs to run. We have a static check stage. For now, it only runs a check patch and is match. We have a build stage where it build documentation and it also build the kernels under different uh, architectures. So by default, it runs on ARM64, ARM and x86-64 using different um, dev configs. We also have a last stage for a cache that you can um, run once in a while and the results of the cache will be shared across uh, all the following uh, pipelines. And we use that mostly because uh, for this match that uh, can, can build uh, a DB and reuse that to better uh, detect errors. So how to use it? So it should work out of the box. You just apply this patch set on top of your branch and you push code to any GitLab instance, you should see uh, your pipeline appearing there. There's also a detailed documentation available where you, you can check with more detail how it works, how the jobs uh, works there. This is a print of uh, the documentation. Uh, as you can see under the URL, it was, it's an artifact that was generated by one of the jobs. So here we have a troubleshooting section. So if it doesn't work out, out of the box, you should just check if CI CD is enabled in your project, if a container registry is enabled under your project. And if you are using gitlab.com, uh, there are a limited number of minutes, minutes that you can uh, use there. So instead of using the resources from uh, gitlab.com, you can uh, set up a local GitLab runner so you can uh, set up uh, your machine to fetch the jobs there and execute uh, the jobs on your machine or in any machine or infrastructure that you have. Uh, to do that, basically, you just go over the web interface, request a token, and pass this token to a script that is inside this patch set, and it should set up everything uh, for you under a Docker container. Right, so uh, we mentioned about what kernel CI, KCI GitLab is, uh, which are the, uh, the capabilities, the supported tests, uh, how to use it. Uh, but now let's understand how we can extend it so to make it useful for different subsystems. To extend it, we have this feature called uh, test scenarios, uh, which allows you to override existing jobs there. You can even change the configuration of the jobs that are already defined, but you can also define new jobs and stages. So, which means that you can completely rewrite the whole thing uh, your own way using uh, these mechanisms. So, let's say that uh, you don't want to test with the default architectures that are predefined. You want to test with ARM64 only. That makes sense for you. Uh, but you want to test with one configuration and make another test with a second configuration. So what do you do? So there is a scenarios folder and you can define the myscenarios.yml file there. In this file, you can just override this dot kernel dash combination job and define, uh, let's say, a job for ARM64 with custom config one with a few enable uh, kconfig and another job, uh, also ARM64, with the second configuration, with other uh, configuration, and that's it. And now, when you push your code, 
And if you set the, uh, the variable KCI underscore scenario that we see in the last line there uh, equals to my scenario, it should read your, the file that we, you just defined it uh, and now execute uh, your configuration. So just to make it clear, uh, let me show you how it works under the implementation. So there is a YAML file called scenarios.yaml there uh, on the top. And the last line there, there's a if KCI scenario. So if that variable is defined, it includes um, a YAML file with the same name, right? Uh, so we can think that uh, we can have um, in, inside the scenarios folder there, so Linux slash CI slash GitLab slash YAML slash scenario, well, we can think that we can have a set of different scenarios per subsystem or even per driver uh, that we can share across the whole community. So we can have a file system YAML file, a media YAML file, a network YAML file, or some specific driver YAML file, or even subfolders uh, with specific drivers. So you can say, if you are submitting a patch to this driver, uh, you can just execute this, um, this test scenario and that will validate everything that the maintainer expects uh, to be validated. So after we submitted this patch, we actually had a good feedback from the community. We had a pushback from the current proposal from Linux uh, because the fear is that sub-communities do things their own way and uh, they f it, uh, there's a fear that they would just ignore the top-level solution and uh, do their own thing. Uh, so Lino suggested that we move these uh, to, uh, to make it as a library under tools uh, slash CI to make this happen. So the next step here is uh, to prepare version two under uh, tools slash CI, and we can adapt the MCI to reuse this work uh, since uh, we need to add other features like uh, especially the um, static checks there and it will actually make my life easier since I don't have to maintain two check patches, um, and especially when we start to expanding this to other uh, subsystems. We need to get more users, get more feedback. Uh, we also want to implement proposed features and implement specific tests uh, to specific subsystems. So just a quick look on the proposed uh, future features that we can imagine there we can expand the, the list of stat checks. We can have the TBS checks, we can have sparse, we can have YAML lint, DTDoc validation, validate, code check. We can also leverage external testing labs so we can connect with uh, other labs, we can connect with bare metal labs, we can even use uh, the kernel CI provided labs. We can also add tests on top of um, virtual machines uh, for instance, K-self test, K-unit test, uh, subsystem specific test uh, through the uh, scenarios feature. And we can also integrate with other services, uh, for instance, meeting results to, uh, to KCIDB KCI DB and so on. So we are almost there. Um, now a few uh, end thoughts about how I see us moving forward and how you can contribute. So with this effort, I really would like more, eff more efforts from the community uh, and contributions uh, to pre-merge test mode. So we have lots of efforts with what we call post-merge, uh, but pre-merge test uh, for the Linux kernel community is really new. Um, and I do think they're really great value, value doing that. Mesa CI is a really great example that we can um, take uh, inspiration from and also get a few lessons learned from there. Uh, I really like to see more communities adopting uh, Premerge and this always green culture. And I'd like to see people, um, more people engaged uh, in this testing culture. That was uh, basically it that I had to share with you. I prepared this uh, documentation about how uh, you can contribute uh, under that link. So under that link, you can find instructions about how you can get started, how you can send patches, uh, which are the communication channels, uh, channels um, where you can um, contact me, 
So please, if you try this out, let me know. It would be nice to uh, see that people are using this. And um, last here, if you want to see these moving faster, so we are really happy to talk about funding. Someone asked me, are you willing to fund someone? So sorry about that, it's the other way around. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> Uh, so just before going to your question, I, just a few more notes. So there are a few related talks that we had today before this one, so you can check the recordings. So about uh, Karen CI, we had Pavel uh, talking about it, uh, about GPU testing, we had David uh, talking about it today, and uh, regarding also uh, the quality of the test in the Linux kernel, we had Alora talking about it today. Um, so uh, those are really uh, worthwhile watching. And also today we are going to have um, happy hour around uh, Kernel CI, which is going to be at 7 p.m. at this location, so Elysian Capital Hill Burley, and you are all welcome uh, to join us, which is like 25 minute walk uh, from the venue. And that was it. Uh, thank you, and if you have any questions, I'm open to listen. Thank you. Any questions? There. Microphone. Yeah, but I think it's, yeah, it's being recorded. I don't know where the microphone is. So maybe you can yell and I can repeat it. <laughs> ah, okay. There it is. Yeah, I was just curious about the, um, you, you might have touched on this, the uh, execution environment of the, of the test, whether that's a, um, in VM, and if so, um, how for like developments in the vert system where you need a host and a guest, you have modifications in both host and guest, uh, do you see that working well with the, the infrastructure that you've already built and, and how it works? Right, so the question is um, when we have tests on top of virtual machines, how does uh, this fits with the infrastructure? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, basically, yeah. Right, so um, this is easier actually because we can use generic machines to run those. Uh, we do that already uh, with uh, their MCI and also Mesa CI. Uh, so we can use the generic runners there. They don't need to dispatch the jobs to any specific lab. Uh, so we just, um, and, and the, the job in the machine, it creates a virtual machine and it runs uh, tests inside it so it can exercise uh, the user space. Um, are you aware of any nested vert usage at all? Um, so, the, so I know that uh, it is a nested virtualization, I would say. The, uh, David, do you recall how this is implemented, actually implemented under MesoCI? Yeah, what I know is that it uses, uh, right now the Mesa implementation and DRM uh, CI implementation, they use um, the cross, cross VM, is that correct the name? Yes, yes, cross VM. Oh, okay. Yeah, the cross VM, a virtual machine for running tests on top. Great, thank you. Yeah, I know Thank that you. the media uh, folks, uh, they are also working on the media CI uh, for the kernel, and they are running on top of Virtme, which uses Kimu behind. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Thank you, that's a great presentation. Just uh, want to ask to you if 
uh, there is any way to leverage historical data in, uh, in GitLab CI. So I know, I know that uh, the, the goal of the pipeline is to give uh, immediate feedback on the execution, but sometimes it's, uh, it's worth it to understand you know, the, uh, the historical execution of, uh, of something. Is there a way uh, in the current implementation to compare with historical data? Mm. Or so the question is if there's a way to compare uh, the, uh, the historical data of how tests were before, right, with uh, the, the current ones. So um, this is a bit hard because GitLab CI depends on the con configuration of the infrastructure. So GitLab CI sometimes doesn't keep, um, so there's a, a retention policy that can keep the logs for a certain period of time. So after some time you don't have the logs anymore. So, um, so the link there that you can see the pipeline and the results are, is not available anymore. Uh, but with the, the files that we mentioned where we track the expectation, the expected failures, uh, the, um, the flakes and the skip file, this is a way that uh, we can track the state of uh, how tests are evolving uh, across time. Thank you. One more question. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, do you already have some rules that apply to subsystems? Because uh, uh, as far as I understand now, any change to any file is triggering a new pipeline. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, at this moment, the, uh, the current state of the, the case I GitLab, I think that, yeah. that you mean it. So the question is if uh, we have already um, a use case, right, of some specific subsystem using uh, the, the, the KCI GitLab implementation. So uh, at this moment, no. Uh, the idea is uh, the first one to be uh, integrated is the MCI. And then uh, we are also in touch with the media CI uh, people and they told us that they would be happy to, to integrate. Um, so I expect this, uh, this work to be like next steps. Thank you. No problem. Question there. Um, thank you for the great presentation. And I'm really keen to see all the future works being done as soon as possible. Uh, I'm unsure if I can fund at the moment though. Anyway, so my question is, do you have some specific priorities for uh, each of the future work items and any timeline for those? Right, so the question is if we have any uh, specific priority uh, for uh, the work there and uh, a timeline. Uh, so let's uh, go back to the proposed future features. So uh, the priority now is actually, it's not, it's not to implement those features at this moment, it's actually to create a base that everybody agrees on uh, where uh, we can then add things on top of it uh, very easily, right? So the priority would be to write the version two um, following the suggestion from Linus, uh, which is mentioned here. Yep. Uh, so moving uh, as uh, to use it as a library under tools slash CI. So move this work there and integrate uh, with your MCI to see how it adapts with a specific subsystem uh, so we can make a proof of concept how uh, these can um, work together uh, for the whole subsystem, for the whole community actually. Unfortunately, we don't have any time um, timeline for implementing uh, those, but I would say so those would be like the priority uh, to work on. Thank you. Yeah, so the comment was the, the main challenging challenge is get it uh, merged. <laughs>